For hundreds of years, ancient astronomers have looked up at the stars and planets, followed by the exploration of space and the moon that we witnessed in the 20th century. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. We are seeing amazing new technologies and achievements that will take us further into space for human exploration and scientific discovery. Microgravity research is essential for us to learn how to live and work in space. We're now in the approach phase, everything looking good. Altitude 4200, go for landing, over. Living and working in space in weightlessness enables the study of long-term effects of microgravity on the human body and also as a testing place to understand what adjustments need to be made before astronauts are sent to Mars and beyond. I was the last one in the vehicle, so I had some time to stand at the 195 foot level and just think about what we we're going to do and listen to the orbiter kind of hiss and moan and groan and it was ready to go to orbit and so were we. It's kind of funny, you're so excited to go and you get out there and you get into the orbiter and you still have about two hours or so where you're laying Eight, your back, waiting for the seven, countdown. Six, five, three main engines up and burning, two, one and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, opening a new chapter in the completion of the International Space Station for the collaboration of nations in space. 50 nautical miles. And then we hit the 50 nautical mile point, and that's the point where Piers and Fyodor and I became flown astronauts. Eight and a half minutes, we were to orbit, and we got to work turning the rocket into an orbiter so we could uh, start with our mission, open the payload bay doors, and we were off and running. We're all on the flight deck here. We all have a lot to do. It's very crowded. We're looking out two tiny windows as we travel along at 17,500 miles an hour. It's magnificent as you move in and look out those windows and look at the International Space Station hanging uh, above Earth's atmosphere. It's brilliant, the color is very metallic and looks almost like molten metal. It's so bright in the, uh, in the bright rays of the sun. And then it's time to open the hatches and what a treat it is to rendezvous and then open the hatch to living people. The crew had been up there about four months when we opened this hatch and uh, talking to other crews, they say that the most important thing for them is seeing new faces. Think about the station as it will become in the future, as it's shown here. How much bigger it's going to get, and we're very proud of our small part in creating this huge international laboratory in space. It is research and engineering that will lead us into advanced spaceships with artificial gravity such as right here in this simulated space station. 
Artificial gravity is desirable for long-term space travel, for ease of mobility, and to avoid the adverse health effects of weightlessness that can lead to serious long-term health problems. One way to create artificial gravity on a space station is to rotate a large diameter station, such as this one with a diameter of 1.8 kilometers, about one mile, much larger than our present International Space Station. Revolving such a station at only one revolution per minute will produce a force equal to one G, one gravity, the same force we experience on Earth. This is often referred to as a centrifugal force creating the effect of gravity due to inertia in accordance with Newton's third law. Whether we have space stations or ships creating artificial gravity or laboratories using microgravity, research must continue in both areas in order to gain the knowledge needed for long-term life in space and the benefits of new materials and research results crucial to our economic success in the 21st century. Microgravity research is essential for us to learn how to live and work in space, so we can explore our solar system and establish colonies beyond our home planet. In addition, the zero-gravity environment will allow for critical research in fluids, in combustion, and life support systems, including the radiation environment, which is needed for future human space exploration. But first, we need advancements in medicine, technology, and science. For example, studies in micro and hypergravity that will help us better understand the effects on humans as we work to improve our understanding of the Earth's environment and the universe in which we live. The experience of living and working together in zero G is just such a magic environment that it just made us feel very close. It made us feel like a family. It's very hard to say goodbye. The commander's shaking hands one last time as we prepare to close the hatch and get ready for undocking. And here you see the shuttle backing away and listen carefully. There's a ship's bell aboard the station, and she rang us off uh, in keeping with an old naval tradition. The Space Tech Microgravity Development Program serves to train and inspire engineers, technicians, and others through an industry-guided curriculum and certification process, incorporating classroom lectures, online instruction, and hands-on laboratory activities. This includes actual zero-gravity flights and exercises to train, evaluate, and certify participants.
could uh, just tell us a little bit about the National Science Foundation ATE program? And the ATE program was created about 15 years ago, particularly to help uh, do the workforce in the United States. And uh, we felt really good about it, and uh, we've got centers and projects going in it. And Space Tech is one of our uh, poster children. Absolutely phenomenal. I would recommend it to anyone, but especially to the kind of people who are part of this group. Scientists, engineers, technicians, people who live and work in the space industry, Understanding what astronauts go through is indispensable for your day-to-day -day job and I really hope that this program is able to continue in the future so that more people can have this amazing experience. And it really is exciting to see the transition between where we've been with the National Science Foundation grant for space tech and where we're going in the future. The vision that people have uh, displayed here and the comments of everyone who enjoyed the flight and the training experience have been absolutely phenomenal. I was selected as part of this part of my position with the United Space Alliance and I gained a valuable knowledge of some of the things that, that the crews in space will have to deal with. It also given me a new outlook on how I can assist when we have an in-flight anomaly or something like that and we're trying to work out a repair. I have a better understanding of what the astronauts are truly going with in zero gravity of what they have to accomplish and some of the restrictions that's placed upon them. Particularly proud of Space Tech with all they've done and all the excitement that we see about it and the excitement of doing this is um, the workforce here is changing but we're sure that uh, all these people being prepared can change as the workforce changes here in Florida and around the country with their other partners. It's probably a once in a lifetime opportunity for a lot of people including myself and it was really a learning experience and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. One of our goals is to prepare individuals to successfully transition from the Space Shuttle program to NASA's exploration mission and beyond.